Oh, people are coming in. Hi, everyone. I see that we've got some folks logging on. Welcome to our last Art Bites presentation. We're just going to give it a couple minutes for folks to log on. We're also going to um, get it set up to stream on Facebook. So that may take us a minute or two. We're just letting everybody join us for this afternoon's Art Bites presentation. We're, it'll be a minute or two and we will get started. Hi, everybody. The clock is saying one. We still have folks trickling on, so we'll give it another minute or so um, before we start today's program, but we're really glad to have you with us. I know we have one attendee who's having some audio issues um, and hopefully if she tries logging out and back in, it'll work okay for her. Um, sometimes I can prompt people um, to start their audio, but with this webinar format, I can't do that. Um, I, I'm going to, Nancy, can you let me know? You can throw a message in chat if you want, um, if we're okay to go, if you got it figured out. If not, um, don't stress. Um, we'll give another, another minute or so. I'm assuming everybody else can hear me because I'm not getting anyone else, uh, <laughs> anyone else having audio issues. Wait, like one more minute.
Okay, I have some introductory comments that will take us a couple minutes. So um, that will allow some other folks to trickle on in the meantime. Thanks everybody for being with us today. I am the director of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts, Sarah Hall. I'm so glad to see you folks with us for this, our last Art Bites. This is a program we've had so much fun with this summer. I've really loved weaving the story of food together with the story of art. And here in part five, our dessert course, we've got an exciting painting to talk about and a really special end of the meal treat. Um, today's program is in a webinar format. You can ask questions in the chat or the Q&A area. Um, Chef Steven will try to answer along the way, but if not, we'll address them at the end. All of this is inspired by the fabulous exhibition Bernini and the Roman Baroque, masterpieces from the Palazzo Chigi and the Riccia, which is only on view for another two weeks. Um, so if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, please get yourself to the museum. Uh, we also have a number of recorded programs on our YouTube channel, including the prior episodes of Art Bites. So you can do a whole Italian meal start to finish with wine accompaniment um, if you go and uh, look at our archive. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the exhibition was organized by Global Project Consulting and toured by international arts and artists. We were so fortunate to be able to be part of this American tour. Um, and I want to thank the following for supporting the exhibition here. Howard Kaler, the James and Mary Schurz Foundation, an anonymous donor, Dr. and Mrs. Robert K. Hobbs, Ms. Susan Chemnitzer, Conservate Inc. and Mr. Louis Kawaja. And um, I might get a little tear in my eye as I say, say thank you to our super partners in Art Bites, the creative, enthusiastic chefs from the Blue Ridge Community and Technical College's Academy of Hospitality and Culinary Arts. The chefs donated their time to this program and the funds that would have paid their honoraria has been used to provide a thousand dollar scholarship to the, their program for a Washington County resident. So it's a really wonderful way of two organizations collaborating together, um, providing some really good um, fun interpretive content and also helping the community. Um, since I'm today's art speaker, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, and then I'll officially in introduce you to Chef Stephen Weiss when I hand the program off to him in a little bit. So I'm going to go up and do go ahead and do a screen share now um, so that I can talk to you about the really exciting um, painting that we have today. Give me just a second. And get the shot. The, um, the uh, PowerPoint up and running for you. So we already know we're at Art Bites, and there's a little uh, acknowledgement of our partnership. Wait a minute. I think I pulled up the wrong screen. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Too many, I have a couple PowerPoints open here apparently. So let me find the right one. No, it is the right one. I just had extra images in it. Okay, coming back to you, going back and trying this again. All right. Okay, this should now work. Okay, there she is, our uh, temptress of the Nile, Cleopatra. And I wanted to um, make you guys look at the painting first. So we're looking at Domenico Fetti's painting, The Suicide of Cleopatra. It's from 1613. And whenever I talk in the galleries, I ask people to spend some time looking at the artwork first. So take a few seconds to kind of take in the image. And if you have any um, reactions that you wanna put in the chat, um, that's fine too. I didn't wanna. All right, well, feel free. If anybody has any observations about this painting, go ahead and uh, share them with us. Ouch. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's a good one. Um, yeah, it does look particularly painful um, that that snake is uh, in a really uh, 
unusual position when they say that uh, Cleopatra clasped the snake to her breast. Fetty was taking that very literally and his uh, his imagery. Um, so we're looking at a paint, if we were looking at this without knowledge of the title, I think everybody would understand that this is Cleopatra just because of that snake. Um, and there are some other clues in this painting as right um, as well. I, you know, I can't think of anyone else as associated with um, death by snake bite as Cleopatra is, um, but let me show you the other clues here. Um, see on the back there in the, on the windowsill, there is a basket with, you can see sort of writhing, there's sort of viper-like heads on these snakes writhing in a basket of figs. Figs look like really, really big um, sort of meaty figs back there. But I think one of the things here that contemporary viewers find when they look at the painting is that this is not the way they picture Cleopatra, right? Um, she looks like a, she looks like a Northern European of some sort. Um, it's especially that luminous skin and that auburn hair. I think it's a color of hair that um, people of a certain generation might actually call Titian hair, um, which is a, um, it's a, it's a useful thing to know because Titian is a Venetian painter of the century prior to Fetty and hugely influential on Fetty actually. So it's, it's not accidental that we have this beautiful glowing auburn hair on our Cleopatra. Um, Titian's dates are 1488 to 1576, just so you know. And, and Domenico Fatti is often called a neo-Venetian artist. He goes to Venice for the last like six, seven months of his life. So he's not in Venice very long, but he was so influenced from the start of his student days by Venetian art that those six, seven months and his interest in color, which is what Venetians are really interested in color and form over line, um, really associated him with Venetian artists. Um, we already talked a little, I'm going to go back to the image, sorry, um, just wanted to make sure all the observations. So when I went in the galleries and was looking at the painting, obviously it's the snake. It's really obviously evoking a sort of dangerous eroticism. And of course we have her in this position, almost ecstatic. Is she in pain? What's happening with her head thrown back there? Um, which also kind of um, it works with the erotic undertones of the painting and the fact that figs are often a symbol of female sexuality. So um, we've got basically an, an erotic painting happening here. And some art historians have said that the, the images of Cleopatra that were pervasive in the Baroque period, occasionally they were paintings of actual women and it was a way that an artist could maybe uh, memorialize his mistress or his lover. Um, I noticed her incredibly beautiful uh, pearl earrings, uh, which I would call Baroque pearls. But on the other hand, they are, um, also something we associate with Cleopatra, which I will show you later. Um, it's really beautiful pearl earring and her embroidered gown is really gorgeous. I love the deep shadow on the right side of the painting that kind of give where the fabric is crumpled up. It kind of gives you a sense of the weight of that fabric. Um, so it's uh, kind of extraordinarily beautifully rendered um, that gorgeous gown. And in case the snake wasn't enough to convince you um, there are the figs, as I mentioned before. That, she doesn't look Egyptian. It's it, the way we picture Cleopatra today has more to do with 19th and 20th century pulp culture than with actual history. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. So there's our, our artist. I have no idea if Domenico Fetti actually looked like this. His dates, he's born in Rome in 1589 and he dies young at the age of 34 in 1623. And this image is from 1745. It seems to be the only rendering we have of him. So it's posthumous. It is from a French publication on uh, uh, short lives of artists. So, um, you know, it may look like Fetty. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be any other, you know, sometimes you can find a painting that matches up with an engraving like this, but there doesn't seem to be anything else. He is a bit of a shooting star. He, as I said, he only dies at eight he dies at age 34, so he has a short life, but he has a really key patron, um, Fernando Gonzaga of the Gonzaga family in Mantua. And um, they meet and they're, you know, have a lot of synergy between them. And when he becomes the Duke of Mantua, um, 
Betty becomes the court artist and he ends up going um, to Mantua. The Cleopatra painting is one of his, here's the Duke of Mantua for you, Fernando Gonzaga. Um, the Cleopatra painting is really early in his career. So he's only about 24 when he paints Cleopatra and he's really influenced by his teacher, Cigoli, who also was such an admirer of the Venetian artists that he really infuses that into Fetty's work. And so um, Fetty, one of the reasons, something we don't think about when someone's becoming a court artist, not only are they getting this patronage, but they're getting access to the collection of their patron. And so it's a really wonderful study opportunity. So when he goes to Mantua, he's able to see the collections that the Dukes have built up you know, over time and study some of these artists that he really admires. Moving on, um, Fetty often is associated with um, melancholy women, <laughs> with women who are having, um, uh, you know, meditative magdalens, uh, women who look sad, um, women, here's a sleeping girl, again, ex really pretty exquisite um, in his coloration and this rendering of fabric with some, some things in common with our Cleopatra. Here's a Magdalene in meditation, um, you know, leaning there on a skull thinking about mortality, but it's incredible, um, you know, yellow gold lining of her cloak. She's got all these um, elements around her of intellectual pursuits, yet she's, it seems, you know, to not be enough to keep one from uh, thinking about death. Um, I thought these were really fun, these two images of young, on the left, young David gathering stones for his slingshot, which is from 1617 or 19 um, period. I've never seen, uh, you know, a David uh, rendered in this way where you really, he does look sort of like at the end of a gangly youth used moving from adolescence into adulthood, um, gathering up these stones, which actually, you know, they're, they're fairly substantial, but um, they don't necessarily look lethal there. And on the right um, is one from 1620, where you have the massive head of David there um, in the foreground, uh, and or of Goliath rather, in the foreground, and David posing um, sort of proudly with the massive sword um, and a hat very similar to the one that you see on the ground in the other painting. Um, um, he did numerous versions of this. Uh, Fatty seemed to not mind working sort of commercially and doing multiple versions of things. Um, in fact, you know, lots of David and Goliaths, lots of um, versions of penitent Magdalens and um, women in different um, stages of repose. Um, here, this is what I was mentioning before, the ability to take a look at the collection of the Duke of Mantua allowed him to actually copy one of the Titians in that collection. So this is really exquisite, but it's actually Fetty working after Titian and inside the collar of the man on the right is worked actually Titian's signature and Fetty has copied that because it's part of the painting. Um, and then another, he did a whole series of parables from the Bible, small and really exquisite paintings that decorated um, one of the rooms called the Grotto in uh, the Palazzo for, for the Gonzaga family. Um, he ends up staying um, in with the Gonzagas till 1622. 223 ish period, um, but then ends up in some kind of this. This seems to be a story common to Baroque artists. He ends up in some kind of dispute in which uh, he leaves, he flees for his life, apparently. He's worried of vende about vendettas. Um, one source said a uh, dispute over a ball game. I have no idea what kind of ball games they'd be playing in uh, Mantua in 1622. That's, that's another presentation. But um, he leaves and the Duke is pretty upset because they did have a good relationship um, you know, with similar interests and a mutual admiration for each other. Um, this uh, picture of the Terrible. I include it in here, particularly because of that amazing sky and those trees. One uh, writer described his vigorous painting as having windswept brush strokes. And I think that sense of movement in the sky and tree, the you know, so literal depiction of wind um, really uh, makes that clear. So, and this is a fun painting. This is so similar to our Cleopatra, although this is uh, surfaced at auction within the last few years. It's a Lucretia um, 
they it's another common subject like Cleopatra that allows for a little bit of erotic titillation. Um, and this is right around the time things are coming to an end in Mantua and he's heading off to Venice in 1622, a violent fight um, of some sort. And so he stays in Venice um, for only from, I think, November to April. And we don't know what come, what happens, what kills him. Um, he is taken ill and he dies. The Duke has been pleading with him to come back to Mantua and saying he'll offer protection um, for whatever, uh, whatever concerns he has about um, retribution and vendettas over the fight, um, but he never has the opportunity. He settled in Venice and he really is um, associated with a sort of new flowering of Vene Venetian art earlier in the 17th century. So um, it's he, he's known for combining this Venetian sense of color with um, the Baroque uh, Baroque trends that he learned in Rome. So I would say particularly in relation to this painting that it's the sense of drama and emotion, right? Um, Baroque paintings, you almost feel them. And uh, that's perfect because we got the um, comment earlier, ouch. <laughs> so you did almost feel this painting, which is what you're supposed to do. Um, so I just thought it would be fun to show you. Here's Cleopatra in pop culture. This is just a Google image search and a screen capture. This is what you see um, if you Google Cleopatra, the straight black hair, um, you know, lots of gold adornments. Um, about the only thing somebody said at one of the websites, about the only thing that's consistent is her eyeliner, um, which is kind of funny. Um, and of course, we have two particularly famous Cleopatras, Elizabeth Taylor on the right and Claudette Colbert on the left there. Um, 1934 for Claudette Colbert and 1963 for Elizabeth Taylor. And back to Cleopatra again um, here, just for a little review. I don't like, don't want anyone to forget our Cleopatra. Here is, um, Sometimes I like to quote scholars other than myself. And here is a little um, section from a book called The Art of Mantua, Power and Patronage in the Renaissance, where they're talking about him. Um, Fetti was trained in the Florentine tradition embodied by Cigoli. The opportunity to study the masterpieces in the Gonzaga collection brought about a significant acceleration in his stylistic maturation. Indeed, he learned much from the delicate colorism of the Venetian painters, from Rubens' expressive power and sure brushwork and from the most analytical northern painters. Um, so this idea that he's studying and he's learning from this exposure to another collection. Um, and then this is a little story about him leaving. Fetty's successful stay in Mantua came to a close at the end of August 1622 while, while playing a ball game. He got involved in a violent altercation. Afterward, he was forced to leave the city to avoid any possible vendettas. He took refuge in Venice and from there he continued to have frequent and cordial correspondence with Ferdinando, who tried in vain to convince him to come back to court, even guaranteeing his protection. A few months later, on April 16th, 1623, the artist who had known better than any other how to interpret the complex intellectual world of the sixth Duke of Mantua had his life cut short by illness. Um, so basically, I already told you that, but this is, that was better words. Um, so here, here we have um, our Cleopatra. Who is Cleopatra? She was the last pharaoh. She was the last member of the Ptolemaic dynasty. So Ptolemy the um, first was, was a general with Alexander and became the first pharaoh of Egypt. And so uh, she's really Macedonian. Um, Cleopatra is not Egyptian, so it's 300 years distant from her ancestor Ptolemy, but most of those Ptolemaic rulers were sort of conquering rulers. They didn't really um, embrace uh, Egyptian culture. She's the first member of her family who actually learned the language. Um, most of the rulers clung to their Greek habits. Um, but Cleopatra actually was known for being very intelligent, speaking multiple languages. And she actually gained a lot of respect and trust um, from her people because of the fact that she knew the language and adopted more of the Egyptian customs. And I wanted to do a little, um, a little, uh, We'll go back here for just a moment before I reveal the little the little slither over to the snake. Um, so was she bitten by a snake? Um, 
Plutarch in his story of Antony, which is really one of the main historical sources that informed painters like Fetty, he says there were two pricks on her arm. Some people suggest that that was a poisoned pin or a poisoned comb rather than a uh, snake bite. Uh, you know, scientists today say that's the snake that would have killed her would was likely an Egyptian cobra, um, which it would, would have been called aspis and, and it's not what the English know as an asp, it's actually an Egyptian cobra. And that they're pretty big and heavy and you're probably not gonna smuggle that in in a basket. And you know, supposedly it also killed her two handmaidens and you couldn't get three people dead from one snake cause they're not gonna have enough venom. So, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, folks saying that the story of the snake bite is in fact a story. And it may be a story that is meant to emphasize her seductiveness, right? That she's this powerful woman who has had relationships with Caesar and Mark Antony. And uh, she's, it, it sort of reduces her in a way to the symbol of her sexuality. Um, you know, a snake and a basket of figs, these male and female symbols and this powerful eroticism. On the other hand, the Baroque folks loved this story because for them, it was about reuniting with Mark Antony. It was about uh, being with her lover, the suicide. So in fact, the snake bite is kind of a love bite and the look of death is the look of a lover, um, you know, being reunited. This is, this is what the Baroque artists thought. This is why she was so um, frequently portrayed. Um, there is our Egyptian uh, cobra. <laughs> cobra uh, that you can see. And it is indeed a deadly venom. It is not a venom that is um, going to kill you quickly or painlessly either. So this idea that she knew her poisons and was picking the best way to go, maybe if she had sedated herself first, um, some people say, yeah, she could have used a combination of things. Um, but we do know some things about, uh, we have potentially images of actual Cleopatra that are not, um, you know, colored by our pop culture. They may in fact be colored by pop culture of, you know, the first century BC. This is the famous Berlin Cleopatra. You see that she has um, the hairstyle favor that she favored, according to documentation. She's wearing the royal diadem. Um, she, uh, you know, this is, these are these attributes that allow people to help understand the, the few images there may be of here, her. Here is a statue in the Vatican collection. So when you're looking on the right, that is actually a plaster recast head on the full figure. And on the left is um, the head that would have been, that's been disjoined from the, from the sculpture. And again, you see the same hairstyle and the same sort of royal diadem as in the Berlin Madonna. And this is a really fun one um, that people think is probably an image of Cleopatra that was found um, in Herculaneum. And it, this is of course, first century AD. She dies in about 30 BC at the age of 39. So this is, um, you know, posthumous by over a hundred years, but maybe closer to her time and maybe more accurate than what we're thinking. And indeed she's shown with radish hair and she has these earrings that are not dissimilar to what Fetty has in, um, in his painting. So maybe his Cleopatra wasn't as off as we think. And I'm just gonna click through these because I wanna show you, I found a database of images of, of the death of Cleopatra and I just want, and they're all black and white, sorry. But I wanted to show you just how many Baroque artists there are, you know, obsessed over, over her. Give you a moment to see. And some are incredibly similar to uh, what Fetty did. It's this vocabulary. And these two Guido Rennies, and, and you can Google Guido Renni and see that he did many, many Cleopatras himself. He's a uh, peer. He's living at the same time as Fetty. Um, and painting his Cleopatra, you know, ours is from around, uh, what did we say? Like he's about 24. So I think it was around 1613, we said. Um, and so Rennie's are later, um, perhaps influenced by Fetty's images. Um, very, very similar and, uh, and pretty interesting. And there we have even Claudette Colbert in 1934 in an incredibly similar pose, um, tossing her head back and clutching the snake close to her breast. Um, I wanted to end 
with a, uh, again, reading someone else's work. Um, this is actually from uh, Keith Christensen, who just retired from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was the uh, John Pope Hennessy Chairman of European Painting, I believe. Um, and he writes about Cleopatra in Something for the Met. And he says, it was Cleopatra's desire to be reunited with her beloved through death that fascinated poets and painters in Baroque Italy. A contemporary poet of Guido Reni, who we were just looking at, wrote about one of the artist's paintings on the theme of Cleopatra's suicide. Ingenious brush, I'm going to go here. Ingenious brush that giving life to Egypt's queen has made her so alive that some before her bow. Fair monarch, not by asp, but love betrayed. Love kills her. The way to give her life, the painter knows, the brush breathes vital spirits in her. So that's plenty of Cleopatra. I'll show you this quickly. This is a 19th century version. We've already got Egyptomania taking hold. They are trying to make it feel more exotic and more Egyptian. This is a, her testing poisons on condemned prisoners, <laughs> delightful. So I'm gonna close off there, um, stop my screen share and introduce you to our chef today who is going to make um, a happy use of figs for us. Um, chef Stephen Weiss is the Associate Dean and Chief Lecturer at the uh, Blue Ridge uh, Community and Technical College Program of Hospitality and Culinary Arts. He has over 30 years of experience. He was a team member and captain for the 2000 and 2003 National Pastry Championships. He's been featured uh, in the media a lot <laughs> and numerous magazines and newspaper articles highlighting his talents. He's known to be one of the top sugar artists in the country, which really excites me because we're actually doing an exhibition soon um, in the that deals with the history of sugar sculpture on dining and banqueting tables. So we're gonna hope to get Steve involved in that some more. Um, he's done training for the White House Food Service staff. We're so happy that we have him in our neighborhood and we're so happy that he's here with us today. So go ahead and take over Steve. Okay, well, thank you. Can, can everybody hear me? Just wanna make sure. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is uh, this dessert is really fitting of uh, you know what we've what uh, uh, you know we've been just talking about with uh, with these paintings and um, you know uh, zabione is uh, is an Italian dessert uh, and I think it'll fit really well with the menu uh, that we had set forth over the last few weeks, um, but. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's a really light dessert and it's a great ending to a meal. Uh, I think more so in Italy when I was there about two years ago, uh, you know, many times we wouldn't really end a dessert in heavy, something heavy. Uh, it would it would primarily be fruit, you know, and uh, and fruit is 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 relatively light, even though some folks will say that eating fruit at night is probably not a good thing for you to have. Uh, but uh, but it is it is it is a lot lighter than the heavy custards and pastries that you would have, even though they're probably a lot more tasty. Uh, this is this is probably better for you to end a meal in. Uh, and uh, it is a very simple dessert to put together. Uh, so if we take a look at the ingredients that we have, we have a uh, a uh, couple of egg yolks here. So I've taken the whites, so I've separated the egg whites. Uh, so we have three egg yolks, uh, have some sugar, and I have some Marsala wine. And we'll talk a little bit about Marsala wine and a little bit about uh, some of the alternatives and things that we could substitute out. I'll also have some fruit over here, uh, nice variety. I have some uh, figs um, that was discussed recent, just, just recently with the, with the pictures. We have some uh, fresh, uh, uh, blueberries and we have some uh, raspberries as well, but you can pretty pretty much put anything that you have. Um, anything that you have is, is perfectly fine. So uh, the way we're going to get this together is I have a bain marie here and a bain marie is basically a, uh, uh, a pot that has water in it. And what you want to do is you want to have a pot that's going to allow to have an air gap between the water and the bottom of your bowl. Uh, you don't want the bowl to be suspended in the water. You don't want it floating in the water. You want it to sit on the rim of the pot, right? Uh, so that there's an air gap in between. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this on and just get this fired up a little bit. Ultimately what I want is, is to have a simmer, right? So this takes like about a minute to get going. But in the meantime, what we can do is we can kind of add our ingredients. 
So here I have some sugar. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a tablespoon of sugar. Okay. All right. And I have a tablespoon of Marcello wine. Okay. You can see I had a little bit of overpour there uh, for Julia Child there. You know, she was a little bit extra and then a little bit for the chef as well. Okay. It's a little too early to have that today. So I'll just, I'll hold off on that. Okay. So uh, Zabioni is the Italian version of, of this dessert. But the French actually, and, and it's very fitting too, because Zabioni was created, so they say, uh, around the 1500s, um, which is about the time period that uh, the paintings were, were basically uh, uh, presented. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's interesting because the, the French have made a, a similar version called a Sabayon. And Sabillon is, is the same version, uh, but it's just, it's the French version. And the French basically adopted the Italian version uh, in the 1800s. And uh, and just basically call it a, call it a, a similar name, uh, you know, we're just changing a few a few of the letters, obviously, right? So we have a Sabayon or a Zabayoni or a Sabayon, right? Uh, it's all the same. So if you go to a restaurant, French restaurant, Italian restaurant, uh, that's where you that's what you're gonna you're gonna look. So in a French restaurant, it'll be it'll be Sabayon, and in a uh, Italian restaurant, it'll be Sabayon. So so what you want right now is you want to get it to a simmer. So I have it at a simmer right now. I'm gonna cut this back. And I'm going to put this on and I'm just going to start to whisk. And ultimately what I want to do is I want to get this nice and frothy and thick. Right. Mm -hmm. well, also too, uh, they think that the uh, Zavion was um, originated in the Piedmont area of Italy, which is the northwesternmost part which borders Switzerland and France, right? Kind of close to Turin with uh, modern day Turin or Turin right now. And in the 1600s, it became very popular. Um, or 16th century became very popular in the court of Catherine de Medici. So you would see this dessert. So you can see it's starting to froth up right now, getting a little thicker. If you feel that the, um, the heat is getting too much, you can always lift it and move it off to the side a little bit. But one thing that you wanna do is you don't wanna just start mixing it and walk away. Okay, so you don't, the phone rings, you wanna put that, you don't wanna answer that call, right? The doorbell rings, you don't wanna go get the door. Okay, this is one thing that you wanna stick with and stay with and just continue to whisk and whisk. Okay. Right now, if you wanted to use an immersion blender, you could use an immersion blender as well. Okay. Or any sort of uh, mixing device that has electricity on it. You could use a, a beater. If that works for you, you can do that as well. Okay. You might have to switch arms. Like I'm going to switch arms a little bit here because after a while, it's a good workout for you. Especially if you're doing it by hand. Right. So um, this dessert also became very popular in the Italian American communities in the United States in about the 1960s. You would see it in a lot of restaurants there. It's a very classic dessert. The other thing is too, is that you don't have to always put alcohol in this. There's a, a, a version, an Italian version called Uovo Sabatuto, which is a, uh, a Zabaglione that doesn't have uh, Marsala wine or any sort of alcohol in it. Uh, and it's done with espresso, a shot of espresso for the children, the kids that want to enjoy, or someone that doesn't drink alcohol normally can enjoy a Zabaglione in a different way. And a Wolvo Zapaduto is basically just beaten egg in Italian, okay, which is kind of what we're doing right here. I sometimes say I'm taking the eggs and I'm beating them senseless. Okay. All right, so some substitutes for the masala wine. All right, so you can use a Madeira, which is a Portuguese. You could substitute that for masala. They're 
and uh, sherry, a sherry wine and sweet vermouth is good. Uh, but preferred is definitely the Marsala. You can see it's starting to get thicker. Definitely, uh, and also too, there's two different types of Marsala wine. There's a sweet and a dry. Uh, typically I would always have the dry because the dry is always good if you're going to make like a chicken Marsala or a veal Marsala. Right, and whereas the sweet probably wouldn't work for that. So uh, I'm going to use the dry because I can always sweeten it with sugar, which is what I did with this. You can see it's already starting to double and triple basically. You see how it's getting very frothy, which is what we want. The proteins in the yolks are starting to coagulate. Plus I'm creating kind of an emulsion basically as well between the wine and the, the fat of the yolk. Right. I just want to just keep on mixing this. Okay. So Marsala is a fortified wine. Okay. And it usually has a distilled spirit added to it like brandy. So if you wanted to, you could do a mock Marsala with white grape juice and a little bit of brandy. If you don't have you don't have the uh, resources to go out and get Marsala wine, you probably have to find that in a liquor store, um, unless the unless the uh, unless you have a grocery store that does sell hard alcohol. But if you don't, you might have what you need in your refrigerator and in your your bar at your house. You can kind of make it yourself. You can kind of see. How, it, uh, how it's going here. Very good, you can see how nice and fluffy this is. All right, you can see that I have my water stills at a simmer, okay? Let's start to see it's kind of like sauce consistency. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna, I think this is pretty good. What you're looking for is a ribbon stage. Okay. Keep, keep, keep heating this up a little bit more and just kind of mixing it. Just want to get it thicker just a tad more. But again, you don't want to walk away, right? So you're looking for ribbon stage. So when I drizzle, when I drizzle the uh, sauce over top of it, it's going to have a little bit of a ribbon, but the ribbon's going to actually be absorbed by the mass. Okay. It's kind of what I'm looking for the thickness, right? And this is something that will not stay very long. You can refrigerate it for, for maybe an hour or two in the refrigerator, um, but it doesn't really stay that long. So if I took this and put this in the refrigerator, it probably wouldn't stay that long, okay? So typically what people would do is they would take uh, some whipped cream. They would take some whipped cream and they would put some whipped cream and fold a little bit of heavy whipped cream. So the cream would already be whipped and you would fold it into this mixture to keep it longer. Then you could put it in the refrigerator and it wouldn't be that big of a problem. Uh, some folks will take the egg whites that you would reserve from the separation of the yolks and you would whip the egg whites, beat the egg whites and fold the egg whites into this. And that will also help to store this and keep this a little bit longer. Okay, but this is something that if you're going to serve it in a little bit of a you know dinner of maybe four or five or six people, um, you would do it basically right before because it, again, it doesn't take that long. And I'm talking, so, I mean, typically I probably would be done a couple minutes ago, but I, I'm just kind of talking you through step-by-step step in what my thought process is and what I'm looking for. Okay, and then also too, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take this off. I'm gonna turn this off as well. And just put this off to the side here. Okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to start to build our um, little thing here that we have going on. I'm gonna put this over here. So we have a, a couple of vessels that you could use. You could use a wine, a little wine glass. Also, this is a little ice cream glass that I found in the cupboard, um, like old fashioned. Normally a stemmed glass is what you're gonna use or what you wanna use. Uh, champagne flute is also very nice, although it can be kind of difficult to you know, dip your fork in, and spoon in there at times. So typically I like to use a martini glass could be, would work out very well. Margarita glass would work out well. 
Uh, but one of these glasses, I like this glass a lot. I think it's a uh, really classic and uh, uh, really nice. I'm gonna, gonna use this and I'm gonna show you exactly what you need to do with this. And very simple, right? You're gonna take some uh, figs, right? Nice fresh figs. You're gonna break off that little stem end and you're gonna cut them in half. You can see how nice and uh, vibrant inside it is. This is a very, very sweet, uh, very sweet high in sugar uh, fig. Very nice, very nice fig there, right? You can see some of these other ones here, probably not as sweet, uh, but look good as well, right? And since we're adding a nice sauce to it, I'm gonna take, and take some figs, I'm gonna quarter them. And then I'm gonna tell you another thing that, that you can do as well to give a little bit more dramatic uh, flair to this dish. Okay, so you can take some uh, figs, a couple of raspberries, maybe a couple of, of uh, blueberries, right? And finish it off that way. Let's take uh, this fig here, put this on there. I'm in, Steve, are you adding them with the skin off or on? The figs? The figs? Yeah, it looks like no, the figs. Yeah, the figs. The fig skin is meant to be eaten. It's uh, it's really difficult to peel. Uh, it's not. It's not. It's as it's as soft as the interior. The exterior is as soft as the interior. Great. It's kind of like a grape almost, but the grape the grape skin is even harder than a fig skin. And you could find this at local grocery stores. I know I picked these up at Martin's over the last couple of days, so you know they're they're available. Uh, also, there's a number of other grocery stores that have them. If you're in the Leesburg area, you can always go to Wegmans. Wegmans usually carries them as well. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this nice frothy mixture here. I'm going to take, right? And right before service, you're going to take a spoon. You can see how nice and luscious that is, right? And it smells really great. It smells really great. So you're gonna take this and just pour it right over top of your fruit. Okay. And let it just seep into the cracks there. Okay, so I'll do one here. And then uh, the other thing that you'll see uh, that will that's kind of dramatic. And I, unfortunately I don't have, uh, actually I might, I might have, I might be able to do it. So what would, uh, let me go grab it real quick and I'll show you. So typically what you would do is you would grab a blowtorch and you could torch the top. So I have a little lighter here that's kind of a blowtorch. I'm gonna take and put some sugar on top of it. And this would be au gratin, right? So we would have this with sugar and we were gonna burn it on the top and we'll see if this works, okay? What we're gonna do is we're gonna caramelize this on top. And this is a really nice dessert to have. You can see I have a, a kind of a blowtorch igniter here so it can uh, easily caramelize the uh, sugar that's in there. So that would be all gratin. And you wanna use a, uh, a glass. You wanna use a glass that actually is, is gonna be heat proof too. So you don't wanna explode it. So you make sure that your glass is heat proof as well. And then we'll just do another quick one here in the in the wine glass here, so you can kind of see both looks. Does anybody have any questions? Nothing has come in since the fig skin, but I, I'll tell you, I personally, my mother-in-law bought me one of those, uh, you know, a torch for uh, doing creme brulee and things, and it's always scared me. <laughs> so yes. maybe I'll bet no, the no, no. now. <laughs> it's very, uh, it's very, it's, uh, it's very easy. They're very easy to use. You just don't want to make sure that you're looking at the uh, the point end when you start it. You know, you want to make sure that you're you're pointing it in the opposite direction. It's it's very easy. You're not going to burn yourself. You know, safety, safety, safety. Um, that's you know ultimately what we do at the school. You know, it's safety and also food safety as well. Um, you know, you really want to uh, be careful. So again, and because this is an egg product, you know, you don't want to leave it out at room temperature very long. That was the question that when she said safety, I thought, I immediately thought of working with the eggs and. Um... Yep, yep, yeah, you don't want to leave this, well, uh, technically, you know, the, the eggs are, are cooked 
Um, you know, if the eggs are cooked, you know, above 165 degrees, um, you're, you're, you shouldn't have a problem. You've killed off any issue. If there was salmonella involved in that, you've, you've pretty much taken care of all that. So typically what you would do is you would, you would serve it in either, either way. I, I kind of like the burnt top because it has a little bit of crust to it. Uh, I would probably, again, put a little bit more sugar and use the blowtorch. Um, but, uh, you know, basically that's, uh, pretty much what your presentation would be. And again, if you wanted to use a different vessel, martini glass would, would work really well. Um, you know, and, and if you wanted to fold in a little bit of heavy cream into this or uh, some heavy cream, like a whipped, uh, soft whipped heavy cream folded into this, it, the lasting quality could be up to, the, the lasting quality could be up to four hours, you know? And uh, my executive producer here on the other end said chocolate. So, and if you wanted to drizzle some chocolate in there too, why not? You can always do that uh, or throw some chipped chocolate in there to enhance it. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's, you know, there's a ton of things that you could do. Uh, it's a really, really simple dessert. So we did have one other question, which was, should the sauce be cooled before pouring on the fruit? Well, so, so you're whipping air into it and you're not really putting it and leaving it on the, uh, the, the heat that much, but honestly, it's really not it's probably room temperature right now and it doesn't take very long to get there. Okay. And, and it's not, there's not enough heat. There's not enough heat reserved in the sauce to, to, uh, to break down the, uh, the fruit. And another question that came in was about selecting figs. Um, Karen says this year I had green figs for the first time. Unfortunately, they were rather tasteless for those yep. of us not lucky enough to have any kind of fig tree. What do you look for when selecting figs? Well, for mission fig, I, these are mission, these are, you know, mission figs. Uh, what I would look for is um, when you, when you look at them, you want to have a little bit of give to them, a little bit of give, right? If they're a little too firm, then they're probably not quite right. Uh, this one has quite a considerable amount of give, but there's also, it's, you could see how, how much sugar is in it, um, but it's going to have a considerable amount of give to it. Uh, there shouldn't be really any blemishes on them. Um, it's going to be firm, but it's going to be, I know it's kind of fake, but it, it's going to have a firmness to it, but it will also have a little bit of give to it as well. Um, and that's probably the perfect. And if I cut this, this one feels like it's similar to that. So I'm just going to cut this in half. All right, so it's not too bad. So this is kind of like halfway, halfway. And this one's another one that, that feels a little overly ripe. So all of these are going to be very, very sweet, but this one here is like candy. Figs are very much like nature's candy. Very, very sweet. Wonderful. I think the questions have slowed, da slowed down. Um, okay. I, I was going to come back on, but for whatever reason, I'm not able to start my video. Um, Nancy, if you're still on, are you able to start my video? If not, people will just hear my voice. <laughs> we had more technical challenges this week than we usually do, and I apologize for that, um, which had me not as relaxed as I usually am. But um, this was a delightful uh, program. Thank you so much for being with us, Stephen. Um, Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having us and our partnership. Uh, you know, we look forward to doing this. Yeah, it's been, um, but it's been really fun. I do think people have enjoyed uh, the combination of art and there we go, here I am, <laughs> of art and, and looking more deeply at the culture. You guys also work some wonderful food history into your presentations um, and it's been um, just a great experience. For those of you interested in more museum programs, uh, Daniel Folco, our Agnita M. Stein Schreiber curator who did one of the art bites, he and I have a monthly program called Let's Talk Art. Our next is September 23rd at 6. Um, we are going to celebrate the museum's 90th birthday with insight into the history of the museum, significant milestones, and highlights of the collection, um, which is a nice reminder that September 16th, we're actually having a birthday party. So if people live in the area, um, give us a call for information because um, we're trying to do it safely. We're hoping for good weather so most of the activity can be outdoors. 
Blue Ridge Community and Technical College is being our caterer. So I'm excited about that. So you can taste some of the food from the program. And uh, we're gonna have some fun uh, games and things that um, you can do in your family groups or your whoever you come with um, inside the museum. We, we do require masks in the museum right now. But it has been a wonderful time spending my afternoon with all of you. Um, see you again online at some point. And thanks again, Steve, and everybody. It, BRC. My pleasure. Bye-bye.